And that is just a kind of evolutionary readiness. So my sense, is, my tendency is to say to relax about spiritual practice. Let it carry you along rather than you getting into making it happen. Now, that, I'm in very thin ice when I say this. Because if you, as you know, in the Buddhist path, for example, is the Eightfold Path, and one of them is right effort. And you definitely do make effort. But the fact that you even read the Buddhist Eightfold Path is already good karma. And the fact that you hear that, see, and it's really effort that's no effort. It's surrender that is no surrender. And it's just a timing process. In reference to timing, a lot of these questions that we come up with seem to get answered along the way here. But uh, I come up with issues in my life and proceed based on what I feel is a direction inspired from my intuitive heart, only to come up against the fact that it was really just my ego after all. Could you speak to us a little bit about our intuitive self, our intuitive voice, and how, how we may use that? Got it. After um, the prehensile powers that we developed some time back, the next really impressive one was prefrontal lobes and the ability to plan, reason, analyze, and so on. And the predicament with every power that you get, every siddhi, is that you get attached to it, you get enamored of it, and it starts to take over your life. And the power to control the universe through your thinking mind starts to become, you become so addicted to it that you are not able to hear a much more subtle way of being in the universe that is not mediated through analytic thought. It is, in if those of you that have read Heinlein's book, Stranger in a Strange Line, remember the term grok which is merge, being with something so intimately that you and it are one. Now, there is a place in us where when you shed the separateness that is created by thinking mind, you begin to know the universe subjectively rather than objectively. You begin to know, know, the, know, know the universe from inside itself rather than from outside. It's the way if you sit and meditate outside and you, like I was working with a woman who was dying and um, she died a few hours after we were doing this and um, we just stood, sat there, she was in bed and I was holding her hand and uh, she said, everything is too much, the light's too much, the sound's too much. And I said, well, instead of defining a boundary, I said, the predicament is you're trying to fit a two-gallon container in a one-quart jar, or two gallons of water in a one-quart jar. Let's just expand outward together and include everything. So we sat there, and I said, you hear the children out in the yard? Let them be inside of you. You hear the clock on the dresser? Let it be inside of you. You feel the counterpane under your fingers, let it be inside of you. My voice, let it be inside. Keep expanding to include within yourself all of it. And we started to transform ourselves into being sharing a space that included all of the sensations. And it was a quality of intimacy, of presence, of um, relationship to the universe, where the word relationship isn't quite appropriate anymore because it's not that dualistic. And at that point, she just turned radiant. She sat up and she hugged me and we started to kiss. And and um, at that point, that whole business of too much, which was based on boundary, she had let the boundary go. Now, in us is that boundaryless way of being in the universe. That's what I talk about, the unitive wisdom. 
but it is masked always by the mind, which is connected to our separateness. And that, and it's important not to, it's important to respect the intellect, not to demean it by any means, but to realize that it has taken control when it should be a resource that's available for you to use when you want to. Like what has happened to me over the past 25 years, I'm sure partly through uh, psychedelics and partly through um, meditation and through grace and through evolution, is that when I don't need to think about something, my mind is empty. My intellect, I'm not thinking. I'm just empty. I'm just here. So that when you ask me a question, I stop for a minute. I go empty. I'm not thinking about the answer. I'm going empty because in the emptiness is the answer. Is a better answer than I can come up with when I use my analytic mind to figure out what I should say to you. And it's it's interesting because when I first started to notice that my mind, I wasn't thinking because I grew up, I mean, when I was a professor, thinking was my stock in trade. And I remember used to, I used to fly my airplane <clears throat> and I used to have a clipboard stuck to my leg, my thigh, I mean, strapped onto my thigh. So I could think while I was flying and write down, you know, hypotheses to test empirically when I got to my laboratory. And um, I mean, I was constantly thinking because that was my, my stuff. And when I started to not be thinking, I began to think I took too many drugs that I was like brain damaged because I wasn't thinking anymore. I mean, somebody say, what are you thinking about? I said, nothing. It's like, am I spaced? See, because it was a pejorative feeling at first, like I've done something wrong. And then I began to hear the, the way in which the Quakers talk about the still small voice within, that you only hear when the, the brilliant trumpets of sensation and thought are quieted a little bit. And then you begin to hear this, this deeper kind of knowing and wisdom. Now, you say, all right, I'm going to listen to these still small voices within. But what the ego, which is, the, which is created out of the intellect, is not about to walk away and say, oh, you're absolutely right. There's an intuitive wisdom that's higher than me, so thanks, see you around, and I'll be here to serve you anytime you want. <clears throat> because it's been running the show for a long, long time. So what the ego does when it sees you've got a new game you want to play it says, sure, and it, then it turns itself, because it has this wonderful uh, mercurial quality, it turns itself into this still small voice within. It says, I am your still small voice within. So, you know, and it imitates the intuitive, that kind of, uh, uh, this, this, the jivatma, this inner, inner place. So what you find is that you listen in as carefully as you can, and then you take an act, and then a moment later, you realize you've been had again by your ego, that you did it. And then you fall on your face, like um, I think it was Sri Aurobindo who said that every time you take a step, you fall and you get up and you brush yourself off and you look sheepishly at God. And then you take another step. And then usually you fall on your face again. And you get up and you brush yourself off, and then you take another sin. Was, could that have been him? I think it was him that said that. Yeah. And uh, that's what I found. I found that the latency between where I thought I was doing something out of the deepest wisdom, and then I realized I was just ego tripping, and just the latency between recognizing that and how quickly I could give it up and say, yep, yeah, did it again and go back to square one to think it through again, to feel, go back behind my thought and feel it again, get shorter and shorter and shorter because I'm not afraid to make errors anymore. I'm not afraid to say, I, I got trapped in my own, my own uh, stuff again, my own needs for security, for my own, you know, whatever, psychodynamics I'm involved in. So I think it's a process of tuning, quieting, that the more you do meditation, for example, and it works, the quieter you are. And as the Tao says, truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. And longing are psychodynamics that are reflected in the thinking mind. Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. When you want things, you see only the outward containers because you're only seeing object. You're only looking outward. 
See, and the quieter you are, like especially if you're in work that involves other people, you begin to experience them from inside themselves. I'm not talking about cities of knowing what they're thinking. That's thought. That's going back. I'm talking about intuitively feeling. So people say, it's interesting. Like when this, when this started to happen to me, more and more people in lectures came up and said, it feels like you're talking directly to me. I feel like you're talking from inside me. And when it works in a lecture, I seem to disappear and the collective, whatever that is, is speaking to itself. And it always intrigues me when it first started to happen. Because it would go from, I'd go out and say, hi, I'm Ram Das, and start with my whole trip. And then after a while, I'd notice as I was speaking that I'd sort of be off in the corner of the stage watching myself speak. And then later on, I had disappeared completely, and there was just speaking. And in those days, when the speaking ended, I didn't know what to do because I wasn't there. And I couldn't get up and go home because I couldn't figure out who I was or what I was supposed to do. And I just keep smiling a lot until I waited for something to happen in which I'd come back into my, you know, my familiar old neuroses and then I go home. And I've learned now to sort of play with it a little more. I was giving a lecture in New York, um, well, maybe five, six years ago, 10 years ago, maybe time flies. And I think it was at the Beacon Theater on, and um, there's a fellow up in the balcony somewhere. And I started to speak, I wasn't feeling, I was feeling really insecure because backstage is really a weird place to be sometimes. And you're going out and people have paid to hear you, you know, and you got to be charming and wise and, and you may, you know, have had a bad dinner or, you, you know, you're not feeling quite right. So I went out and what I usually do is I go into routines at that point. Funny thing happened to me on the way to the forum, you know. <clears throat> and um, so I went out and I started my routine and a guy up in the balcony screamed, Ram Dass, my heart hurts. Now, what I can usually do is I could turn a whole audience against him. You know, just by being long suffering, and then everybody will get angry at him. But I realized that he was right. That his heart hurt because I was speaking from a place of mind. This was only three minutes into the lecture. I said, Well, if your heart hurts, our heart hurts. Why don't we stop and let's all, let's chant for a while. And the whole evening turned into back into the heart. So it's tricky to talk about the heart because. There are these different levels of heart. There's the emotional heart that you're familiar with, the kind of um, the, what poetry is about usually, except mystic poetry. The dramatic, romantic qualities of heart. There's feelings of love and hate and, and jealousy and, and uh, sweetness and tenderness and all of these emotional states. And then there's this deeper heart, this intuitive heart this place where, like uh, Sam was talking about the sin sin yesterday in meditation, it's the place where the deeper mind, that kind of um, gestalt mind, and the subtler emotions all come together, and you're connected to the universe, and that's the qual. That's where love exists, where presence and love is. Yeah. Next. Uh, how do we integrate uh, an intellectual understanding of the impersonal nature of reality with feelings of prayer and devotion? Oh, shall I read that again? No. Nope. Okay. Right. okay, read it again. An old question. How do we integrate an intellectual understanding of the impersonal nature of reality with feelings of prayer and devotion to a personal God, to a, a yeah. personality? Um, There are, um, each of us is starting, not only in an evolutionary sense, but in a, um, in the broad karmic sense, from a unique 
place in terms of our sadhana, spiritual practice. And say somebody starts with a very um, strong emotional heart. That means they 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 are very um, they're very romantic. They're very emotional. They relate to people very emotionally. They are not very analytic in their mind. Um, for that person, what might be most attractive as a practice to start them is to take their strength and play upon it. Their strength is dualistic, means relationship to something. But if you start to pick something to relate to, like Christ, or like Maharaji, or like um, Krishna, or Ram, or so, the relationship, because what happens is, as you love somebody so much, you begin to open to the qualities of their being, and that starts to color who you are. That's the quality that, as the love deepens. So what happens is a person starts in bhakti yoga or devotional yoga from a relational, emotional place of, I love you, Krishna, I love you. But if you ever do long chants, like sometime we might, uh, I don't know that we can this week, but like often uh, we do like all night chants. Um, if, if you just do say a chant to Ram or Krishna, and you can start out with it saying, oh, Krishna is this beautiful blue boy playing the flute, and I love him, and, and he's God, and he's play. And you'd start with your conceptual mind. And then as you keep doing the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Then after a while, you start to forget thinking about it so much, and you start to move into your throat, and you can feel it. And then after a while, it starts to move down, and starts to come in here. And it's still, it's dualistic. You're still thinking of Krishna as there. And then what happens is, it's like the foreplay brings you closer and closer together until you're about to merge. It's just about the moment of orgasm, but it's just a little separate. And you stay right at that edge between dualism and non-dualism. And... At that point, the emotional romantic quality has left and a different kind of devotional yoga has taken over where you are riding the place of dualism to keep taking you into non-dualism. And it's the same thing as Soham. It's, you're doing it with every breath. You're, going, you're merging and coming back into dualism. You merge and you come back into dualism. And when you're like... Om Shri Ram J Ram J J Ram. The Om, you go back into the one and then you come out into dualism and you go back into non-dualism and you come back and you stay right at that edge between dualism and non-dualism. At that point, any romanticism is left behind. I mean, my relation to Maharaji has gone way beyond, oh, he's uh, the romantic quality of guru. I mean, that's not really what the issue is between us anymore. We share a space, a presence together that is very soft and liquid, but it isn't romantic and it isn't very emotional anymore. It's just presence together. So um, people climb the ladders in different ways. A lot of people work with astral entities in order to go through the astral as climbing the ladder of astral. That's def very different from Zen Buddhism, which is the steep path with no railings, where you just say there is nothing to hold on to. There's no dualism, there's no form, it's all crap. See, I played with it the other night when I said, there is no method, there's nothing to do. What are you all doing here? And everybody gets a little edgy when I say it. See, what I do is I throw a Zen line every now and then in into this basically bhakti retreat. Just to remind you that we've got it, we can't hype ourselves. The end point isn't dualism. The end point is where you're what Buddhism says, samsara and nirvana are one. Form and formless. Dualism and non-dualism are the same thing. They're just two sides of the coin. But as long as you're trapped in dualism, you've got to extricate yourself from dualism. How you do that, you can use dualism to extricate yourself from dualism. That's what devotion is as a yoga. It's a technique of dualism that takes you beyond dualism so that you can come back into dualism without being trapped in it. That's the strategy. The strategy is going from the two to the one, and then when you're in the one, one and zero are the same, and then you come back into the two. Because one is still something you're looking at, the one, meaning the one plus me. And then when you merge into the one, it's zero, and then you come, and then there's no coming and going. 
You're coming and going is nowhere but where you are. And then the zero and the one and the two are all the same thing. So, I know that's far out, but can you hear what I'm talking about? Anybody hear it? Is that dealing with the question? It's more like how when it's easy to blow away all the concepts and the forms with the idea of then and the idea that there is no path, there is no goal, how do we get the juice and the devotion to a particular form to make bhakti yoga work, to make that yoga devotion work? How do you get bhakti yoga to work? When, when it's so easy, and people are blowing it away all the time, saying, you know, that everything is one and that we don't, you know, there's no path, there's no goal. And you can be Zen and you can use Zen to kill devotion, use devotion to kill Zen and find it. Well, you don't wind up nowhere. You wind up... Um, um, see, what I do... I mean, I ha I'm, I'm criticized a lot because I seem to be such a dilettante and such a, a kind of a collector. But when I go into a scene, like when I go into a devotional scene, all those Zen ideas fall away from me and I just am devotional. That's what I do. I mean, I surround myself with devotional people. Like, I'll go to India, to Maharaji's ashram, and there'll be a nine-day Durga puja. You know, a puja to the goddess Durga. And I, uh, they ask me to be one of the lay people that participates with the Brahmin priests. And I put on a fresh dhoti and a korta. And I go in, and they put tilaks on my head, and I start in. And by the third or fourth day, I am dancing. I mean, when I was traveling with Swami Muktananda, years ago, I used to be ecstatically dancing all the time. I mean, he was a Shaivite too, but it was a very bhakti thing that I was involved in. And I would get into these bhakti realms. And then when I go to a Zen, when I sit Zen, all the pictures of Maharaji go, all that stuff goes, and all I'm doing is this. And I just go in here, and I just go in. And then I see all that stuff as a bunch of illusory crap. So that when I go and study with Sayadaw Upandita and do the Vipassana meditation, it used to happen when I first started to do those things. I would go to those things, and I'd keep the picture of Maharaji under my pillow for a quick hit. You know, it's like a, a peanut butter bar or something like that, you know. And... Then I noticed after that, I didn't really want that stuff anymore. I didn't really want to muddy the thing. I wanted to do each one cleanly. And when I went to the Benedictine monastery, I did the offices every day, the, you know, and sang to the Virgin Mary in the crypt at night and all that stuff, and I just, like, went into it. And if you're going to drink of it, you got to drink. You can't sit and hold your virginity. you got to go and do the thing, you know? So my sense is that if you feel that your heart is the way or that you could work with your heart now, then you go into an environment and you get the gospel of Ramakrishna and you get, you know, you get all the things that help you do that and work with it. And then at other times you uh, do it the other way. Okay. All right. Great. What are you doing? Fine. Uh, exactly. 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 I feel frustrated and unsatisfied uh, still after trying many different practices and, and paths. Uh, could you share some insights with those of us in this dilemma? I think I have a follow up on that. Sounds like a presidential. Uh, I have a follow up on that. So. <laughs> um, Well, Peter, the predicament is that we are on a journey, and the interpretation of the journey is done by our mind. And our mind creates thought forms, which are the result of our karma. And the thought form of I'm stuck is a thought form. It's no more than a thought form. You can engage it, and when you're identified with it, it all seems stuck. Like, I'm ugly, or I'm inadequate, or I'm beautiful. They are thought forms. And to substitute, wow, I'm really moving, for I'm stuck, is just another thought form. And if you are finally, this is what I've been saying about meditation, 
you finally get so irritated, which is just the thought form, with your thought forms, which you are, which are, each thought comes along and says, think me, I'm real. God, I'm really stuck. Shit, I'm working and it's not working. I'm not getting anywhere. See, I mean, you just created a whole drama, a whole set of thought forms. You've climbed in, closed the door, and got all cuddly in this thought form. And that's who you are. And partly, I am driven, finally, for me, to sitting down with a tough Burmese master who says, bring your awareness to the rising and falling of the muscle in your abdomen. And you go in and you say to him, Sayadaw, I am stuck. And he said, bring your awareness to the rising and falling of the muscle in your abdomen. You say, you don't understand, I'm stuck. And he says, bring your awareness to the rising and falling. And you finally say, okay, damn it, I'll do it. And if you were thinking of the rising and falling of the muscle in your abdomen, you couldn't be stuck because you can't think two thoughts at the same moment. And since stuckness is only a thought, it's a thought that has been elevated to a reality. Just like all the rest of the thoughts that you and I are encased in, like glue. And the beauty of a mechanical technique of bring your awareness, I mean, when you think that I, with a PhD and all this training and all, will go and spend like three weeks, as I just did, 17 hours a day, bringing my awareness to the rising and falling of a muscle in my abdomen. I could have read books. I could have amassed knowledge. I could have thought important thoughts. And all I was doing was extricating my, I, myself from identifying with my own thoughts. And the thought that I am a sadak, the thought that I'm going towards enlightenment, the thought that there is enlightenment, the thought that I'm stuck, these are all, all they are are thoughts. And finally, you are driven. You are driven to meditation. You see? You're not because you ought to do it, but because you can't stand being stuck in this crap that your mind is creating and then saying, think me, I'm real. And just going... And when you, that's when you're using dilettantism, or I'll try this method, or I'll try that method, to get unstuck, you're elevating stuckness to the domain of real. Because you're doing something to get rid of it. And all I'm saying is to see stuck as just another thought, and unstuck as just another thought. You're neither stuck nor unstuck. It's just rising and falling of the breath. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> I hear it too. That's the horror of it. <laughs> follow up. No follow up. <laughs> oh, it's a beauty. It's a real beauty. Yes. If, if you know that you have and you're living a life, um, that reflects that as best you can in life. What is the motivation for practice? And, and sort of you talked about the whole issue that we were interested in, in the whole issue of motivation and spiritual practice and various discussions of that. Knowing your God and being God are two different things. I mean, intellectually, we all know we're God. I mean, we are, most of us understand that. Um, the um, direct experience of merging into it is another matter. And what seems to happen as you evolve spiritually, the the impurities or the, the things that veil you from being your deepest truth become more and more unbearable. That's really what happens. And not, I'm not talking about the judging mind coming and saying I'm bad for it. It's just that you can't, it's like 
It's like if you have a lover, but you're always separated by some veil from that from that lover. It becomes unbearable after a while. You just keep wanting to rip the veil apart. And I'm so aware, for example, in myself, how when I don't clear my mind, when I don't extricate myself from identification with my thought forms, my whole life gets thick. I can feel the thickness of it. It's a sort of a dense quality. It's where I'm really like I used to be. And it's all fine, and I can get through life, and it's all going fine. Everybody likes me, and I like everybody, and I'm making money, and I'm doing my life, and I'm getting up and going to bed and doing good. But somehow, it's not living truth. And that absence, that distance from that living truth, from that lightness, from that playfulness, from that clarity, from that sweetness, from, from the seeing the beauty, the beloved everywhere I look, without thinking, ah, there's the beloved. Right, that's a different thing. All right, when you have to impose a game with your mind on it, somehow you lost it, or you know. So the process one is you can't stand it, and that pulls you into practice. It pulls you into practice. Once you have tasted, you are hooked, and you will try very hard to forget it, as I've said many times. But you can't forget it. For somebody who has not, is not awakened, none of this makes any sense. For somebody that started to be awakening, awakened, at first they say, well, that's lovely. I was awakened and I'll uh, do it on Sunday mornings. As time goes on, everything that takes you away from it becomes too painful. And, and the horror is when the things that you held dear in a romantic, dramatic, psychological sense start to turn into nothing because they're keeping you from God, and you can't bear them. And that's a stage, because when you get rooted in the spirit, then you come back and you can be in love with all of that again. But when it seems like an obstacle, and the obstacle isn't the thing itself, it's not the child, and it's not the job, and it's not that, it's where your mind is in relation to it. And then you get, so you're driven to meditate, because you can't stand the way in which your mind is creating the division, the separateness, okay? Uh, when I really get into meditation, I, I find it hard to cope with uh, the pressures at work and so on and leading a generally indulgent lifestyle. Is it but leading a generally what? Indulgent lifestyle. Indulgent life. Yeah. You find it <laughs> difficult to be indulgent. Yeah. Right, well, yes. <laughs> It's a real but, problem. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it possible uh, to keep this lifestyle, and especially, you know, like a, a pressurized job and so on, and also follow a spiritual path? You understand the question? Anybody know? Uh, he's asking if uh, if you have a tense, uh, intense life uh, works and uh, you meditate very much, sometimes you find it difficult to keep the game together in your work. And also in terms of um, just the way in which you, the gratification structures you've set up in life are difficult to keep going when you meditate. And is it possible to do that? What we're speaking about here is the shifting of the motivational structures for why you're, why you're performing an act. As you meditate more deeply, you start to see the act you're doing in a different light. And you start to see who it is that's doing the act in a different light. Now, the question is, can you shift the inner nature of your being and continue to do the act externally, but now from an entirely different place. Like you can go from being an achiever who is doing an act in order to prove that you're good and get approval from somebody else. And then you see through all that 
And then you're doing the act because it is appropriate livelihood, and you don't care whether they like you anymore, but you do it very well because it's livelihood. Then you may see through that one, and then you're doing it because it's what you do. The same act is being performed, but who's inside is entirely different. Most people, when they're going through shifts of motivation for behavior, feel the need to change the external. What's really required is just the changing of the internal, not the external. Like somebody comes up to me and says, I heard everything you said, I'm going to go home and sell all my antiques. And I say to them, if you really heard what I said, you wouldn't have to. Because we're not talking about changes in the external life, we're talking about changes in the inner being. And the inner being, now some things will fall away because they just won't be worth the candle anymore. They're just not worth the effort. I mean, a lot of people that you are with, like you will find Gur Gurdjieff, the Russian philosopher, said, as I got deeper into my spiritual practices, your friends you will, will find you becoming dull. And he said, but there's worse yet to come. <laughs> See, and the fact is that it's the... The reason you're with people, you're so used to lying and being charming and doing all that in order to be approved of and loved. And as you don't care about it as much, you don't make that effort. And as you don't make that effort, people find you dull. And it's interesting. And then there's a whole new ball game because then they turn away from you and then you end up having more time to meditate. <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, I would say that as a result of deep spiritual practices, your life will change. But that it is not inherent in the meditation practice that it needs to change. You could keep the same practice, except who you are is changing, and therefore why you would keep the same practice is changing. So when you say to me, can I keep the same lifestyle when I meditate deeply, I'd say sure, if you want to. But that wanter gets changed in the process of meditation. And then you probably won't want to, right? But you could keep a stressful job and then ex extricate yourself from being stressed by the job because you can learn to play with it rather than being played upon by it. Do you hear that one? Like when I was taught, when I taught at university, most of the students came in, were very anxious about examinations. I was the professor. They wanted to please me. They wanted to get in close to me. They were, I knew them all well because they were like me. Then every now and then there would be a student who was at university with complete self-confidence, knew what they wanted to learn, saw me as an employee, came in and said, I'll take this tutorial with you. And they, were, they weren't they were the least bit interested in pleasing me. They wanted to learn a body of knowledge. And I was clearly a maidservant or a handservant to them. And that was, a, and I found myself being, you know, very jealous and very punitive of them because I couldn't hardly understand them. They were doing the same work and they did a work all the time, but they were doing it from an entirely different place. You hear that? Is that dealing with your question? Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, my daily life practice is choiceless awareness when I can do it. Do I say it slower and enunciate so I can hear the words? My daily life practice yes. is choiceless awareness. Choiceless awareness. It's a Zen yes. practice. Just being aware. Yeah. And making no picking and choosing. Yes. And then I come down and I'm aware of the, the predicament that I'm raising a child with someone who is violating her. He's causing her much pain. Now, if I stay choicelessly aware and there's no error in the system, I feel part of it. I feel terribly, terribly guilty and shame in every part of me. And I don't want, I don't know what to do. What you're saying is a reflection of a confusion between choiceless awareness and action. That you can be aware of an entire situation and act to stop something without losing your choiceless awareness at all. Choiceless awareness 
means that your awareness is spacious with what is. It doesn't mean, as I said before, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preference. It's, it doesn't mean you don't have preferences. It means you're not identified with your preferences, but your preferences arise as the situation demands it. It's situational preferences. If this person is doing something destructive, when you see somebody is doing something destructive to another human being, and you're in the situation and you have some degrees of freedom where you can do something about that, that's part of the existential situation. You can sit there just with awareness, just being aware of it all, and out of that, if you're just absolutely quiet and present, will come a response to change that or to stop that. The identification with the response is where the trap is, but not the response itself. For example, you could be sitting very spaciously and you put your hand down here and it turns out you just put your hand on a hot stove. And you feel the heat and then you lift your hand. And you stayed perfectly aware, perfectly quiet, seeing it all. Or you can feel as it, oh, and you get into my hand, you identify with the hand and the burn. And there is a way in which you stay very, very present behind action, and yet you act in a way that relieves suffering. That's what I said about seva. We are interested in relieving suffering, but we're in a way in doing it that doesn't create more suffering. And in a way that we can, through the process, become more conscious. So, don't confuse choiceless awareness with inaction. It has nothing to do. To say, because I am choicelessly aware I can't act, is a choice. If you are purely choiceless awareness, action will come when it's appropriate to act. And when you're in the presence of somebody being hurt by somebody else and you have some of the cards in your hand, you act. You act in a way that doesn't close your heart. You act in a way that doesn't make you reactive. You act in a way you don't get stuck in your anger and your horror of it all and all that drama. But you still act. You still act. Okay? Question? Can you describe the nature of the moment of opening, transmission, of enlightenment, this uh, thing of which is of no difference, but also uh, <coughs> the most ultimate difference, in some vague sense, sort of like uh, turning on the light switch in the Tower of Arichana. One tiny flick and the whole universe is illuminated. Well, I'm going to give a brief answer to that because other groups will deal with that also. Um, there are the moment of awakening, which is the beginning of the process, the moment of awakening, is the moment when you recognize that what you thought was real isn't, that there is a reality that lies behind the reality that you were entrapped by. And you, it's as if you just were in a room you've been in all your life, and suddenly a window is opened and you're aware that there is a vast vista of which this is a tiny part, and that you've been building your entire universe within this tiny reality, which is made up of psychology and body and life and drama and birth and death and all that stuff, and you suddenly see that that is just, it's just a little, a little sequence. 